want to apologize on behalf of, or on behalf of myself and the Copenhagen uh, train station for being so awful with timing. And yeah, I just wanted to apologize to both of you all and my teammates for that delay, that nail biting delay. Um, so yeah, I will be giving a presentation entitled No Slavery, No Exceptions, a brief history and exploration of the United States prison labor industry and what we can do to help. Just want to make sure that's okay. That's how you do it. Okay. <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln, the 14th president of the United States, issued the Emancipation Proclamation on the 1st of January, 1863, as the nation approached its third year of the bloody Civil War. The proclamation declared that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are and henceforward shall be free. On December 6, 1865, shortly after the war ended, the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution was passed, stating neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States, or any place subject to their jurisdiction. To white Americans and white abolitionists, this meant the end of slavery within the United States. And, the end, and an end to the African American subjugation to forced labor and objectification within the United States legal system. However, to African Americans, this presented a whole new chapter of slavery within the American prison system. That sentence, except as a punishment of, for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, has created more slaves and more money for the U.S. economy than ever before. My presentation today will be about how slave labor in prisons is still the cornerstone of U.S. economics, how it came to be, and what you and I can do to help the victims of this billion dollar industry. Mass incarceration and prison labor began after the collapse of slavery industry in the American South. After plantations were suddenly deprived of workers, the system of conventional slavery needed a replacement, and fast. As the anti-black rhetoric in the South was stronger than ever, African Americans, now legally free people under the United States Constitution, were arrested for things white Americans could never before imagine being arrested for, like loitering or staying out past curfew. Thousands of African Americans, almost overnight, went from being free people to slaves on plantations again. Fast forward to the 1960s, a decade of progress and civil unrest within the United States, during the time of the Civil Rights Movement, when communities were taking a legitimate stand against laws segregating black and white citizens, as well as a plethora of other injustice, injustice, injustice marginalized groups face, <coughs> as well as a plethora of other injustices, marginalized groups face suppression of free speech that was reaching levels it hadn't seen since the repression of workers' rights demonstrations and women's rights demonstrations in the early 20th century. Protesters were attacked with water cannons in the streets. Mass resistance was met with attack dogs and riot police. Under FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, those protesting the war in Vietnam and those participating in revolutionary black liberation groups were attacked with utmost force. Revolutionary socialist and black nationalist group the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, or BPP, was founded in 18, 1966 by revolutionaries Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale. Practicing methods of self-defense against racist police attacks and forming community social programs like the Free Breakfast for Children program, the Black Panthers seriously challenged the society that had for so long kept African Americans and other marginalized groups in chains. Group um, built in emancipating the um, 
African American from the oppressive systems that the United States was pushing onto them. Um, they did this by, this is a little controversial for the European audience, but they um, embraced the Second Amendment, which was the right to bear guns, um, in a way that um, black people had never been able to before, because the Second Amendment, while still a um, revolution, or while still a like intense freedom for Americans, was really only available, like all freedoms, for white Americans at the time. But instead, when the when the Black Panther Party would witness um, police brutality, they would go and just survey the scene and create a presence of security and um, just general safety for their black communities. They released something called the Ten Point Program, which was a um, revolutionary Marxist text um, dictating the demands of the Black Panther Party. They were not actually physically violent with the government. They only, in a new way, um, presented a uh, presented a presence of the black people that Americans have never seen before, white Americans have never seen before. Um, it was something completely new, and it, in, in this tenth point program, assured, uh, assured housing, um, room for our ability to grow and to form a career that uh, could, that was just a total shock and a revolutionary idea for all Americans at the time, really. Um, fast forward to, uh, there were political um, assassinations, or there were targeted assassinations of various um, civil rights leaders, like um, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and Malcolm X. And during this time, uh, the FBI were sending various threats of death. Um, J. Edgar Hoover, I talked about him before, he was especially brutal with his letters to Martin Luther King Jr. telling him to pull, like, you know, kill himself, but just to drop the movement entirely, or else he'll face repercussions. And then mysteriously, both of these figures died while they were really um, uniting various marginalized groups in the United States, which was pretty much a threat to the Nixon administration and all these horrible, unjust uh, administrations at the time. And so they needed, the United States government needed a way to systematically destroy these groups, or else some revolutionary um, movement would take place in their streets and they couldn't take that. Um, uh, they, um, after the targeted assassinations, they needed something to further prevent these groups from forming in the first place. And that brings us to the war on drugs. And now, I think that without, or given with our history of drugs being illegal, the idea of a war against an inanimate object is a pretty ridiculous one to begin with. Um, and uh, has proven to, I think, I don't know, I saw a um, satirical piece of, um, the U.S. Um, formally admits or surrenders to drugs against the war on drugs, and I think that that's more accurate than uh, it presents itself. Um, the drug war has only resulted in um, thousands of lives being lost, thousands of lives shattered, and that's actually what it aimed out to do in the context of black revolutionary movements. Um, Richard Nixon formally started this war on drugs. There were drugs legal, but he created the Drug Enforcement Agency, the DEA, and he created, he really enforced these drug laws. Um, and it was later revealed by Ehrlichman, um, his, uh, his, one of his top advisors at the time, that they actually created this war, and they, they created these drugs being so intensely illegal, and sending you into, you know, like almost a lifetime of prison for, in prison for simply possessing this, you know, this drug that most people were doing at the time. And he essentially said, well, I obviously don't have it written down, but it was basically um, that they created these, uh, this, this war to imprison hippies with marijuana and to imprison black people with heroin. Both of these groups were doing this at this time, but they, the war on drugs was a motivation for them to go and invade these homes, destroy these families, and to put people behind bars for life, and children's parents being taken away, um, revolutionary groups being attacked with the utmost force, and it was more of a sort of secret way to attack these organizations because obviously they couldn't just make being black or being a hippie illegal. They needed something illegal that they were doing already at the time. So we have the war against drugs and the, um, and the target assassinations almost completely destroying these revolutionary groups that promised a future for marginalized people in America. Oh, hey, 
Can you know this book here? About that. <laughs> He's, um, the, yeah, the uh, White House counsel to President Nixon on the rationale for the war on drugs, John Lickman says, look, we understood we couldn't make it illegal to be young or poor or black in the United States, but we could criminalize the common pleasure. We understood that drugs were not, not the health problem we were making them out to be, but it was such a perfect issue that we couldn't resist it. And I think this is a moment we need to step back and really think about the entire structure of the United States prison system and what it has developed into from this. The prison population in 1970, right just as the war on drugs was being declared, went from 357,000 to 1,179,000 in 20 years. Um, 1,179,000 we The United States has the highest um, prison population. We have about a third of the world's entire prisoners. Um, we have about, I think at the moment, 2.4 million people in, behind bars. Um, and, yeah. um, and you can see here the more specifics of it. It's a little small, but I'll, I can link to these later in the Facebook group. Um, this is just, out of all the state prisons, federal prisons, local jails, um, territorial prisons, immigration detention centers, we have way too many prisoners. These are not people that are being um, helped. These are not people that are being given rehabilitation. These are people that are locked away so they can do one thing, and that is produce for the American economy. This is, these are people that are just locked up for, if not petty crimes, they're still being locked up and kept away from getting any help, from having any community access to the outside world. And that is something that is in plain sight, and especially in a European context with the Scandinavian prisons and all that, just plain out evil. Um, one in nine um, men in general in the United States are arrested. Uh, one in 17 white men, more specifically, are arrested. And one in three black men in the United States will be arrested in their lifetime. And, um, you know, I assume you guys haven't been through the United States legal system before, but um, hearing from what it's like, uh, they completely turn you into something that's not even human. They uh, objectify you, they put a number on you, they put you to work, or they just straight up beat you, or, yeah. The American prisons, and especially those which are, have a huge point in the industry, are, um, are not places that one gets better, or one stops being a criminal. Um, and in fact, it was a Russian anarchist, um, Peter Kropotkin, who once said that um, prisons are the universities of crime. And I think that for the United States prison system, that is more true than ever. Um, one in five people who are incarcerated are um, locked away for, um, just because of the drug, drug war. Um, uh, the prison labor industry is one of the most massive industries in the United States. Um, these are people who are paid pennies on the hour. Um, they are not given sanitary conditions. They are not, they do not get, um, they do not get air conditioning in a 110 degree temperature. And, you know, thank God that that's not Celsius, but, you know, try to work. So, <laughs> I remember calculating it, but uh, my friends are loving me, so. It's like 45, it's like 45. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, 45 degree temperatures. And they're not given air conditioning, and they're working in kitchens. Um, right now, you know, thousands of people are being locked away doing that exact thing. Um, a lot of these prisoners are locked away, and they're actually doing the work in the prisons themselves. Um, meaning that, like, they're doing, you know, paperwork, they're swapping floors, they're, um, you know, doing just normal prison work that employees are just hired to do, but this is actually done for free, or it's done for, you know, pennies on the hour. Um, people are given maybe two peanut butter sandwiches a day for food, um, and they are, you know, this, I don't know if you've ever seen any images of the United States slavery system when it was, you know, a full legal slavery system, but um, this image right here is especially horrifying in that context of um, insanely um, high amount of uh, mostly black and Latino people being slaved away to produce just pure wealth for the American economy, um, locked up in there for, you know, God knows what they actually did, uh, it just matters what they were producing. Um, the, let's see, yep. um, they, <laughs> The, you, what, what one could do is um, boycott all of these companies that are using um, the United States prison labor. 
Um, but I find you'll see that it's kind of difficult because the companies that really, these are just a few of the companies that um, profit off of prison labor. Uh, AT&T, uh, if, if you call into an AT&T and you talk to a human being um, uh, you know, for customer service, that is probably a prisoner. Same with Verizon. Uh, Bank of America, they make things for Bank of America. I don't know exactly what they make, but they use it. Um, well, as far as same with them. Uh, H&M, uh, we all love H&M. Uh, they definitely use tons of prison labor. Um, Exxon Mobil, Johnson & Johnson, McDonald's, uh, the United States uh, Army, um, Microsoft, Motorola, Nintendo, um, PepsiCo, so it's Pepsi, Lay's, Tropicana, blah, 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 um, Shell, <laughs> uh, Starbucks Coffee, Walmart, Wendy's, and many, many more. Um, I find that in the United States, uh, there is a very large attitude of um, drinking water. <laughs> um, and also, uh, making some sort of a protest or some sort of a, um, a presentation like this about third world countries and the industry and the sweatshops there. But what a lot of um, American activists don't, aren't aware of is this actual industry in the system. They, they're, there's, um, it's almost disgustingly ignored, um, for good reason, because it's covered up by, um, by uh, you know, a lot of these, a lot of mainstream media doesn't necessarily want to talk about it, because it's not a problem that they can ignore thousands of miles away. These are actually family members of uh, the vast majority of Americans being locked up, or, yeah, we don't really know. Um, uh, here's another picture of um, a plantation out in the south being run by prisoners. Um, and I think at this moment, uh, didn't really plan to talk about it, but since I'm kind of just going with it. Um, just recently, while I was putting this project together, uh, former presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, um, they, someone on Twitter found in a book she wrote about her life, um, talking about living on Bill Clinton's mansion when he was a governor um, in Arkansas. And she talked about the slaves that were working for her in the kitchens and on the field, and or the prisoners working for her. And the way she talked about them was almost like you would hear from a like governor's wife in the slavery era in the United States. Um, she said, "Wow, they're actually, you know, these prisoners. They're they're actually human beings. You know, they're thinking, you know, like just any other rational human being." And uh, she came under a lot of fire from that. And I think that is just funny that it was so relevant to the presentation here. Um, uh, a lot of, yeah, a lot of these people actually work for government buildings in the United States, like just doing random sweeping jobs, not even just in prisons. They're actually like working, you know, for all these mostly white Republican politicians and um, the way that that mirrors uh, the actual U.S. prison, or the actual U.S. slavery industry in the 1800s is very, uh, very, um, you know, disgusting. Uh, you know, um, I, another, um, I guess this brings us to what we can actually do instead of just going boycotting or trying to promote boycotting. Um, one is um, a organization that I've only just really grown uh, to know, which is the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee. Um, they are a sort of a branch off of the IWW, which is the um, Industrial Workers of the World, and they are a group that's been fighting for human rights, uh, for workers' rights, um, and you know, fighting for um, people staying alive under the system of capitalism for the past hundred years. Um, and Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee pushes that to a new level. It is working to uh, better the conditions of prison workers. Um, they also have, like the uh, Black Panther Party, a program and, and a set of ambitions and goals, which I can you know post later in the group or in the Facebook page, um, in order to better the lives and working conditions for people who generate billions of dollars for the American industry. Um, and you can, you know, go on their, on their website, which I'll link, which I'll link to, um, uh, and donate to, to help prisoners um, membership to this. They get a regular newsletter and they get a regular outreach to movements organizing around the world um, to help their cause. Um, and that brings me to the second way that you and I can help, which is a lot more simple. Um, and that's very, um, yeah, this is another picture of I walk. Um, and that is writing to a, 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 to a prisoner directly. Um, 
writing to prisoners, or yeah, just prisoner letter writing, is one of the best ways that you can help out a prisoner, just more directly and more, you know, in, in a real, in a lot more of a human way than just simply donating money. Um, what prisons try to do is crush your relations to the outside world and crush your spirit of hope of ever achieving change for your conditions. Um, uh, and writing a letter to a prisoner completely puts all of that away for just a moment. Prisoners have written that they only feel really truly happy when they receive a letter. Um, that can be it can be about the most mundane things like, oh today the weather was like this and this and this. Um, I'm thinking about these things. Here's what I'm doing with my life. Um, how are you doing? You know, I've heard about like, like I've heard about you. I'm interested in you and creating a real prisoner pen pal. Um, what the original plan was for the whole um, fiasco before this uh, was to create a prisoner letter writing workshop where you would all get a link to, or you would all get an email you can write your letters to, um, and there would be a big list of political prisoners in the United States, their addresses in the prisons that they are in, and, you know, obviously what they are in prison for, and their names. Um, and you can actually write uh, in email form, which will then be letter, later sent as a letter. Um, <clears throat> you can actually write to one of these prisoners, and which I've done only a few times before, but I think seeing the prisoner's name and seeing, you know, about their life a little bit and why they're locked up, because sometimes these people are locked up, just like Chelsea Manning was locked up for um, leaking information about the United States torturing people, um, reading about their lives and what they've done, uh, and then actually writing to them and knowing that they will see your letter uh, is one of the most rewarding and touching feelings uh, you can, you know, explore. I, I've, I've experienced uh, working in activism in general. Um, and, yeah, uh, I think that um, as an international school, or as, as a school, a bunch of cultures coming together despite all odds of some of our governments trying to keep us completely apart, um, it is our duty to bridge that gap of solidarity that is constantly being torn down between people um, being oppressed and the people oppressing them. Um, I'm not saying that with this movement is going to, you know, I'm going to start a revolution for the system right here and we're going to go, um, you know, liberate all these prisoners as much as I'd like to. I mean, if you're interested, you know, go for it. But, um, <laughs> but what we can do and what um, can only really be done is spreading awareness about this system um, and spreading awareness for what we can do and letter writing and organizing demonstrations against this. Uh, and on September 9th, um, incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee, um, the September 9th of last, or, yeah, last year, um, organized a demonstration worldwide and a worldwide led prisoner, or a nationwide um, prisoner strike. That means that there was no work done and that there was no functioning of the prisons. And just for a brief few moments, even though it was eventually crushed, um, these prisons ceased to run. And what that tells each of the prisoners working in those conditions.